Hello, everybody. Um, I'm George. I'm I'm here to talk to you uh, for around 45 minutes about the evolution of propaganda into strategic communications and what effect that had on um, our societies, how elections are influenced by powerful people. And um, maybe after these 45 minutes, we can talk about how we as um, members of the civil society can react to um, these sometimes harmful tendencies. So uh, while you um, listen to my maybe not so soothing voice, I invite you to read the, uh, the text that you have in front of you on the screen. It's a quote by Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays was the um, nephew of Sigmund Freud and is the inventors of the concept of public relations and one of the grandfathers of the whole idea of marketing. And he, at his time, was a very prominent and very influential figure that did not shape, just shape the um, course of marketing or public relations, but the course of um, our world and how we live in it. Le um, he lived from, eight, from the 1890s uh, up to the 1990s. I think 1991 is when he died. So um, he had a, a long and influential life. And I'll start off um, my little story with um, some of his tales. And so we, at the, at the moment, we are in the, um, between the uh, First and the Second World War. Um, up to this point, products have been sold, like you see on the left-hand side of your screen. A product is something that you describe, and you list the benefits of the product, and through a rational argument that is ideally well presented, um, you, uh, you make a case for a person buying your product. On the um, uh, right-hand side, you, you see the, the evolution that kind of happened where Edward Bernays was um, you know, partially responsible for, which is the understanding that, um, that a product is, is something that gives you a feeling. A product can give you the feeling of freedom, of success, of um, being envied by others. And uh, he understood um, very well how to um, um, create these emotions through advertisement. Let me give you a concrete example. And between the First and Second World War in the United States, it was um, a social no-go for women to smoke in public. And uh, Edward Bernays was hired by uh, tobacco lobbyist companies to um, change that, to um, um, make women smoke. And he assembled the most beautiful movie stars at the uh, New York Independence Day Parade. And he gave them all a cigarette and let them, uh, and he had let them walk down the, um, uh, the street smoking a cigarette. And then he ran to all the press people who took the picture of the same boring parade as uh, every year and said, look, there's a feminist uprising for the equality of women. And these women were breaking a social taboo in public. Everybody recognized these women because they were movie stars. And he, he, he was very successful in, in making women smoke not just in the United States, but uh, by knock-on effect around the world. He, uh, he also drove um, the idea of um, a thin woman and thin woman smoking um, as a correlation, because if you, if you smoke a lot, you don't eat as much. And, um, and this theme was permeated throughout pop culture and uh, the zeitgeist and uh, the, the consciousness of what it is to be a, a woman. Um, at this time, at this time, there was also a change of how the household looks like, what, how, how the, is a modern house designed, and he worked with piano companies um, um, making um, competitions, writing articles in journals about the importance of the music and the family and having a room where children can practice music with their teachers. And what do you put in a music room? 
when you are a wealthy uh, family man at this time? Well, in the music room, there's just one musical instrument that's large enough and impressive enough, which is a piano. So by knock-on effect, he um, was able to um, um, spread the concept of the music room and in consequence, increase the sales of piano. At this time and before the World Fairs were an, an important event where um, companies and countries all over the world um, uh, came together at one place and exhibited new innovations. And if you're familiar with the with these times, you know that the um, the future looked very bright at the uh, at the beginning of the Second World War. Um, nuclear cars and um, and uh, were not in, uh, were not yet on the on the horizon. Something that people thought about, but it was clear that within uh, 20 to 30 years, people would be able to have like personal aircrafts and like the, 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 the future was within grasp. And Edward Bernays was one of the curators of this World Fair. And when the, uh, uh, these World Fairs were always there for a year, so everybody could see them, soldiers, nurses, school children, everybody was drawn to the fair. Um, and, and because of the start of the Second World War, nationalism was introduced into the concept of the fair. Like you see the, the, the difference between the poster from 1939 and 1940 and the feature of the American flag. Um, propaganda was more and more understood as the concept of creating fears and belonging to groups and um, and, and the instrumentalization of psychology on Mars was driven to new heights um, through uh, uh, propaganda on all sides. Um, they, sometimes it was difficult to distinct what is propaganda, what is entertainment, what is news. Following the, um, the Second World War and Edward Bernays, um, uh, activity for the uh, uh, American propaganda apparatus. He helped in the uh, uh, overthrow of the um, uh, democratically elected Guatemalan government in uh, 1952. Anybody um, familiar with South American politics or international politics is well familiar with the um, um, epidemic of coups, uh, pseudo coups, um, within countries organized by all parties um, um, in conflict in the Cold War. And this one is of exceptional um, ruthlessness because of its use of propaganda. What happened? The um, uh, first democratically elected um, president of this country was elected because he planned to take away uh, 20% of the land of all large landowners. The largest landowner at the time in this country was um, a United Fruit Company, which later became Chiquita Banana. And they uh, worked with the CIA to uh, overthrow the, um, the government. Um, they were able to, uh, to work together this closely because they were family relations amongst the um, um, managing. Um, level of both organizations, United Fruit and CIA. So they, they were able to work over family dinner, basically, um, on, on these plans. And why was, it, um, why was it so relevant for propaganda? Just a small unit of, um, of radicalized merchant mercenaries were flown into the uh, capital and, and um, violently entered the um, parliament building and took over power uh, while assassinating the, pre the, the president at the same time. And while they did that, there was the sound of war uh, coming from helicopters um, that were circling around the major cities of the uh, country. So there was a, a collective effort to make the, um, the population think that there is a big coup in the making, which is partially legitimate. In reality, it was just a small number of um, mercenaries who, who then installed themselves as government 
um, introducing 30 years of military dictatorship uh, marked with torture, suppression of any types of freedom. And while this happened overseas, um, within the United States, there was also a lot of propaganda at work, um, making sure that um, you look out for communists that are your neighbors, making sure you duck and cover um, in case you see a nuclear blast and to believe into the concept of bunkers that are like a safe place where you be safe of a, of a nuclear war and after a couple of days, if you're lucky and you're in an advanced bunker, after a couple of weeks, you open the bunker doors and there are buses there that take you into parts of the world that are safe. Um, but still, propaganda was used to meddle, um, um, strategic communications was used to meddle within foreign governments. So here's another example from. Uh, Indonesia, where um, there was um, a, um, an, a group of guerrilla that called themselves freedom fighters, who were undermined by exploiting a local tale of a, they, they believe the, the people, they believe in something like a vampire creature, they'd uh, bite into the neck of people and let them bleed out so they can drink the blood. So, um, part of the American government together with the um, local government in the country organized um, an episode of a killing of uh, high level members of this guerrilla faction and displaying them in the fashion like you see before you um, together with markings on houses that all indicated a vendetta of this mysterious uh, vampire creature. Um, this together with other actions led to the downfall of, of this guerrilla movement. And um, as you, um, um, as you uh, know from from the beginning, I'm trying to get into more into um, the modern day. So I, I I'm skipping a lot of examples. I'm skipping the end of the Cold War and its effect on propaganda. But I I wanted to um, to get quickly to the modern day and and rise and heighten your attention towards how propaganda affects our day to day life. For example, these mechanisms and, and methods that were refined by Edward Bernays and other people throughout the wars and, and coups and, and, and intelligence activities slowly made their way uh, from the military industrial complex into the industrial complex, where now large companies have access to these methods and use them. For example, in front of you, you have the gut milk campaign, one of the most successful industry campaigns in the world. Um, a similar campaign is, I think, started in, in each country. Some of them are may, maybe still running in your country. But the, the essence of it is uh, people realize that you don't need to drink cow milk as an adult. And that, in fact, drinking milk is like if you don't need it to survive, is actually a bit kind of. Um, um, yeah, not not as healthy a source of, um, of of protein or calcium or whatever you have than other sources. So the the uh, uh, milk industry, which is at the same same time also the meat industry, came together and they came up with the gut milk campaign, where uh, movie stars, people with respect, people of power. Um, were were displayed um, with this milk mustache, and just by uh, displaying people of power that other people strive to be and and adore, except as role models, just because they could convince them to to be part of such a campaign, um, parts of their um, circle of influence now also drinks more milk, and this is one of the a prime examples of how industry creates needs. Um, another um, example is uh, margarine, which was uh, basically an invention because there was not enough butter to, to go around. And there are, even though it is debatable, um, I'm, I'm convinced that the uh, margarine is, uh, is far more inferior product um, health and taste-wise. 
Um, let me move on further into the modern age. You might be familiar with nudging. Um, nudging is the process of forming an opinion or bringing you to a decision without you being really aware of this process. For example, if you're thirsty and you go in a store, you mostly go for the drink that is at eye level or arm level, just because it's the most convenient one to look at and to grab. Um, and that means supermarkets use this effect to put the priciest or addictive um, drinks in, in, in this part of the, of the shopping aisle. Another example is don't mess with Texas, where um, Texas had, still has a huge problem with littering, people throwing trash out of their cars. So who do Texans show up to? A quite rebellious um, bunch of, um, of people that put the individual, individual um, uh, above everything else. Well, they recruited the football team. Uh, strong athletic men, uh, role models of many men around the uh, around Texas, and they were shown in in a TV commercial uh, um, picking up litter with this "Don't mess with Texas" drum, and, and and looking steer into the camera and saying "Don't mess with Texas" while picking up trash. Again, an, a campaign that uh, was really successful in stopping littering. Today's examples are product placement. Um, you, you're watching um, commercials without being aware of it. Uh, uh, infotainment, the mixture of formats that you cannot distinguish if what you're reading or watching it right now is paid content or not, as well as an increase in the gamification of our work life. Here, I put a couple of examples of how gamification looks like for an, an, a driver, but the um, um, using reward structures of rewards that are digital and therefore have no real intrinsic benefit or value to a worker um, uh, seem to increase the productivity of the worker. So um, the mechanisms used by um, East um, German or um, Soviet uh, time industry to uh, um, uh, promote uh, workers' efficiency through badges still works up to today. It's just here in digital and slightly more gamified uh, form. And these um, methods are also used for elections. So um, I, I'm presenting this to you because you are most likely a thought leader in one or another aspect of your professional life. And it is essential for you to raise awareness within your communities about the extent of how propaganda is used in order to undermine, create um, democracies. So I am now turning the last 20 minutes of my presentation into a deep dive of how um, these methods of strategic communications and propaganda that I've just basically touched on anecdotally, um, how, the, how these processes are used uh, by private companies in order to manipulate elections. I'm using the example of uh, uh, strategic communications laboratories and Cambridge Analytica because it's one of the most well-known examples and there's a lot of data that has been leaked over the years that I can now draw up on um, in order to present this, um, this, these methods to you. But please be aware that there are certainly a lot of other companies, either um, private companies or organizations owned by the government that use exactly these methods, if not even more advanced methods. I had the opportunity to shift through uh, thousands of pages of leaked uh, documents of um, these companies that I've mentioned before. So what I'm giving you is, is just 
the top of the iceberg. And I strongly encourage you to do your own research uh, with regard to your own country and how these companies or other companies um, operate them. Who are these people that run these companies? I mean, you're probably familiar with the story. Cambridge Analytica was hired by the Brexit campaign and by the Trump campaign. And working with them, they were able to use targeted advertisement, advertisement that is generated for a very small portion of the population that has been analyzed before and is spoon fed to this small portion in order for them to change their mind on a very particular issue, which then has knock-ons effect. So these people are um, either coming from the, from the research uh, part of you know, doing social research that are basically the people that are doing the analysis of the population and how people think and how the work of these organizations affect how people think as well as um, a people that shift between the uh, government sector doing propaganda and the private sector doing PR. And you will see that these uh, lines between PR and, and uh, like state propaganda um, are, are kind of fluid. Um, so how does the process look like? Like, let's say you want to um, buy the election in your country. Um, how, what, what, what are they offering to you? Well, they are offering to you a, a whole suit of services that complement one another. So you don't really have to do a lot of other things apart from work with them when it comes to your communication strategies. Um, but, uh, especially uh, online and digital communication. So on the left-hand side, you, you see a matrix of errors that kind of feed themselves. So they set up a system where they analyze and model how the population is and how they might, how parts of the population might react to specific messaging. That's what you see in the segment development. That's basically where they look at the population and they create target groups and they bunch them together uh, according to specific data points. They create a, a strategy. That is what's called dashboard strategy here. Something that I'll go to in, um, in more depth later. And they, they uh, collect responses out of the social media activities and everything that they do that feeds back into the strategy and into the modeling. So you can see it's a machine of evaluating what people think, creating propaganda, and see if people change their mind. The data analytics part is what got them in trouble the most, a part of um, breaching uh, weapon export embargoes. So uh, they have a very sophisticated team of um, analysts and, and data model experts, people that work with big data. And they, they work um, uh, together in order to, uh, to model these um, target groups. And, um, and I think what's, what's important to, um, to keep in mind is that within this work, what Strategic Communication Laboratories or the Cambridge Analytica did is, is that it's not really about you go to the population and you ask them, what do you think of this political candidate and what do I have to tell you in order to change your mind? No. What they do is that they work with psychologists, just like Edward Bernays did, with really good psychologists and child psychologists who come up with questionnaires that you don't understand that this questionnaire is about your political point of view. But these questionnaires are very abstract as questionnaires about variety of topics in your daily life. And through the, um, um, the magic of uh, psychoanalytics, you can deduct um, how you see the world in, um, according to your answer. So it's, uh, it's not so much about let's make these people do this thing. It is more about can we take this thing in such a way that people who should get it do get it. So they themselves, this is from a whistleblower 
from um, from this company. So they themselves understood much more that it's it's just about changing specific points of your attitude or of your worldview, and your worldview will change over time. And the data they are using is incredibly um, um, complex and, 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 and holistic. They have access to um, data from Facebook. Uh, so Facebook knows already quite a lot about the population, but also about data that you are usually able to buy as a private company when you do market research. So any questionnaire done by any other company about any about anything, you are able basically to buy these data um, batches. And they're really good in bringing all of these batches together and create a huge data set out of which they then can, can deduct their, um, their conclusions about what messaging might work for which um, uh, target group. And, um, and what is really important is that um, the data, that's why you have a pirate flag up here, the data collection is not just done through, uh, you know, getting the data from Facebook and these things that you can buy, but also going into the dark web and, and dealing with hackers and buying big data chunks with chunks with hackers that they got from governments or private industry. Uh, this is, um, um, so if you basically got enough money and you get all of these different data points, you uh, quickly come to the realization of how powerful a data set has been and, and, and how telling. Now, you know enough about the method, how do they actually gonna spend your money? Well, you as somebody who will decide the election of your, com of your country, you will be doing that by standing in a control room. And the control room will be buzzing of activity of all these different parts of the machine that I've outlined you in abstract manner. But part of the um, marketing material that you receive as a potential client of this company, you already can envision your control center and how you'll be standing there um, spending money from your old friends, smoking expensive cigars, and, and, and looking at all this fantastic uh, propaganda and how it changes the attitude of people. The, the methodologies exact, exactly are pretty, um, uh, are, are pretty detailed and it would take too long to go into detail. Um, so what I've done is I've basically just, I'm showing you a couple of snippets of how, um, um, how things are analyzed. So you see on top a statement. This is about a Mexican political party, a political party from Mexico. And, um, and they, they kind of analyze how they can use the statement. In, in, a, in a, you know, spin it in a negative, in an unrealistic way. Um, they are also good at creating the, the campaign strategy from the beginning to the end. So what you've seen up till now is more something that is reactive, but they are, the, the strategy that they create beforehand is making sure that their communication appeals to just these target groups. Their communication is not supposed to have mass appeal. Their communication is supposed to be spread within these target groups as a form as of like a meme or, you know, you can trust me, you know, we have the same type of humor. So it's very different of like how people traditionally think about, um, about how propaganda looks like and it is like easily recognizable. It is really not. There is a lot of talk about how influential this company is and the methods that they have been using. They have been active all over the world and it is just one of these niche companies. They gained um, uh, specified status 
by the British government because the methods that I've touched upon before, they were um, under a weapons embargo. Um, so they were not like you were not allowed to teach anyone about these methods that I've just um, uh, outlined to you. In um, 2016, there was a cooperation with the um, US State Department of, um, where they started to train uh, people and, and maybe even conduct an operation, not much is known about this. And in 2015, they uh, worked with the NATO Stratcom Center. And the, the NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellent Excellence is already quite a mouthful and gives you an indication of how good these people are with strategic communications. So they are amongst the world class of how to do co strategic communications in, uh, in, in war scenarios, not as much within democracies. Um, and then there is this um, quote by another whistleblower, which I thought is very telling, like, you know, you have these companies with these data sets and these weapons embargo grade methodologies about how to manipulate societies. And these are the same companies that advise political candidates within uh, their own countries, like where they're based at. And there's no checks and balances there. Um, and even if there would be an effort to create them, I'm sure there would be more than one strategic communications campaign launched to undermine this campaign to regulate this industry. Um, and the the other um, quote, uh, other thing that I wanted to share with you is with regard to uh, how absurd and abstruse the information is that they can use. So you probably know on Facebook and other social media, there are like um, small quizzes where you can find out which friends, Simpsons, uh, Dragon Balls character you are. And um, that is also where they get their um, their data from. So um, the more you participate in the online sphere, the more um, these companies gain power. And when they um, were working on the uh, on the Trump campaign, they were to a large extent responsible for the. Um, um, for the uh, for the uh, for the great propaganda against Hillary Clinton, and anybody who followed the campaign is probably in agreement to to uh, when I say that uh, Trump uh, won because Clinton looked so bad. Uh, he did not win because of um, charisma or personality, but because of the tremendous um, uh, negative uh, propaganda that was run against the very. Uh, um, uh, against a career politician. Now, we live in a world where um, these, oper these operation centers uh, creating propaganda were run by, uh, tr traditionally they were run by intelligence agencies. And now this with this knowledge um, about how to do these things has moved out of, of the military into the private um, uh, world, where uh, NGOs are in part extensions of um, strategic and propaganda campaigns without e maybe even being aware of it. So this example shows you um, uh, a leaked document from a unit within the CIA that talks about how can we make sure that Europeans still like the war in Afghanistan. And this paper came to the conclusion that the best and easiest way to do so is to drive a campaign towards uh, women rights in Afghanistan. And even though the, the war might be unjustified, but uh, the uh, the situation of women in the country is so horrible that we have to continue the war in order to liberate them. Something that is then picked up by large NGOs, and I'm not sure if that is a coincidence. Um, on the top uh, right hand side, you see the um, a picture of a, of a humanitarian food ra ra ration that is dropped by uh, American forces. 
and next to it is something called a cluster bomb or a part of a cluster bomb that is uh, dropped by um, American airplanes that also drop the humanitarian rations. Uh, in the, the picture in the center and on the bottom left are basically um, people lying to the world in order to um, convince the public perception. Um, and uh, the bottom right hand side is the uh, is a picture of a mine that looks like um, a, a child toy. Um, it I thought was a, a good fitting to end this presentation and, and open it up to you everybody because these pictures speak about the absurdity of the world we live in and how um, two plus two equals five. And uh, there is no um, there is no common ground and no reality that we can agree upon um, anymore. So um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for uh, for sticking through my rambling. As you can tell, I'm very, very, very passionate about this topic, and about uh, and the civil society sector becoming aware of these technologies and using these technologies whenever appropriate for their own ends. Do you have any questions? Or if I can throw a, um, a question to you, how does propaganda affect you and your political, political views? Or how do you see in your, in your societies and communities how propaganda plays a role? And has it really reached your grandmother and your little nephew already, or is there still hope? <laughs> oh yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, on your presentation. Um, you, you stated that um, SEL and Cambridge Analytica, um, they actually, uh, they use very subtle techniques in order to gauge the audience and the techniques to actually uh, use for disinformation, or can I say launch information warfare? Look at the case today we have with Russia and Ukraine. Um, how much have these companies gone to convince um, a big segment of the global population that Russia is evil, Ukraine is innocent, yet when we look at things in the ground, although this war is really bad, but in a way, it one side has been demonized to the point that you, that even atrocities committed by, say, Ukrainian soldiers are even overlooked. And uh, how far has this uh, campaign been used in uh, in the in the Russian Ukraine war? I have one more thing on that. Just just because my question is quite similar with Paul's questions, but with another perspective on its roots. Uh, so it's been for six years that NATO is trying to campaign against Russian misinformation. And surprisingly, the system was so good to make the Hillary campaign, you know, that looks so bad against the Russian misinformation. So my complementary question to, to Paul's questions is, uh, what is what is the Russian propaganda system being used to counterreact Cambridge Analytic Western style of misinformation? You know, <laughs> uh, or counter misinformation campaign, something like that. Because we clearly see both sides are winning in the misinformation campaign. You know, uh, and maybe it's the only winner up to now in this war is the misinformation. Um, hey, Ricardo and Paul, thank you so much. Um, I uh, I think, okay, there are two questions here. First, uh, um, um, uh, Ukraine, Russia. Second question was how, uh, how can Russia, or is Russia resilient, right? Did they have some kind of form of immunity? And um, okay, uh, first question. Um, um, who is this communication that I talk about targeted towards? 
this communication is not targeted towards you. This communication is targeted towards decision makers within specific parts of the population. So Russia in their um, propaganda, in their, um, uh, their covert information war traditionally has been using, um, I'm sorry to simplify it, it's really bad of me to use like left, left uh, think tanks, foundations that spread money uh, through donations to youth um, centers or to uh, activities with elderly that in, in, in one respect or another uh, improves the image of Russia. And uh, that's been going on up till uh, to this day where uh, in my country and I'm sure in your country, you have politicians uh, making the point for um, Russia and against Ukraine. Um, but um, it is easy for us to tell that they are not so good in doing that. And we are not affected by Russian propaganda whatsoever. So I think it is fair to assume that for the Russian propaganda Tsar, it is completely unimportant what we or you or the West or the English speaking world as far thinks about Russia. And um, if you follow their the activities of their, the, or if you change, if you see at the change of their diplomacy, that seems to be uh, reflected there. So they are kind of basically say, we'll just work with the people we want to work with, the rest we don't really care that much about. And this is, can also be used as a propaganda um, tool, whereas we can't break through the wall of propaganda. However, I wanna um, now, so this is my point of view, but um, I, I, I really got to say that the war propaganda specifically made for, for people that are not directly involved in the war. So the propaganda you get is not the propaganda Ukrainians get or Russians get, right? So the, um, um, the, the propaganda is on a very different level and it's supposed to have a different effect than it's supposed to have on the Russian people or on the Ukrainian people. But there are, um, there is um, uh, an effort of the Russian uh, propaganda people through social media to use um, a free press and, 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 and free journalists and, and highlight the, 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 the victim role of Russia within this conflict. And this is some, somewhat working. When it comes to the resilience of Russia to these methods, it is not that Russia is resilient to the methods, it is more that Russia learned much, much earlier than anybody else about the sophistication of the propaganda and they did not counter it, they adapted it. So their propaganda, if you look at Fox News and if you look at the Russian state news, it is very, very, very similar. So the way of like special effects of like big words that like be afraid of this and what is coming next and all of this is crap um, is, is copied one-to-one -one. and, and the, that kind of shows you the resilience of propaganda. You cannot really counter propaganda, you can just do it better. But there is no way of making you resilient for propaganda because we're all human people that think with our hearts most of the time and with our heads just sometimes. I hope that answered your question somewhat. Yeah? I can answer. And what about pro-Ukraine propaganda, like the way mm -hmm. um, certain um, media, especially if you look at the media in the United States and even in Europe, how they've taken like this very, very, very pro-Ukrainian stand to the point it has even influenced policy such that countries like Sweden which are, and Finland, which are once completely neutral, are taking steps to join NATO, which is unprecedented. And uh, this could even make things even more tense. So mm. do you think these companies that you mentioned had a role in this in order to convince people through also the mass media and social media to influence even decision to the point that even politicians are even uh, thinking of going to join NATO when traditionally they've maintained uh, neutrality? 
Absolutely. And uh, these companies are always active on each, on every side that has the money to afford working with these companies. Um, I think that the change of um, neutrality has a lot of uh, to do with the trauma of the Second World War and the role uh, Russia played with these countries in the Second World War and how this, like this, it was, if it did not awake past traumas, it was really easy for a propaganda campaign to awaken these past traumas because it's not even a hundred years ago. Like uh, our our grandmothers still can tell about atrocities Russians did, you know. Uh, so um, that is one the, the one side, and the other side is the quality of propaganda coming out of Ukraine for English-speaking people. I strongly encourage you to go on the Reddit on the subreddit of Ukraine. This is reddit.com slash r slash Ukraine. That was formerly the Welcome to Ukraine website run by, uh, I think, some admins in the tourism part, uh, tourism department of the Ukrainian government. And when the war started, they became one of the international hotspots of where people that wanted to help got information about where to help and got um, uh, videos of um, of fighting. So um, as somebody who, who watches the news, you never see people or tanks being shot or explode, very rarely. If you go on the internet, you can see all of these things um, um, unfiltered, but you don't really look for it. And the, uh, the Ukrainian subreddit is so great in mixing memes, and um, and propaganda and information that um, it, it creates a new quality of, of war propaganda where um, I think you might have seen um, documentaries out of Iraq or Afghanistan where the groups are embedded, uh, where journalists are embedded with the troops and they are reporting live from this military outpost in somewhere in Afghanistan and they're in the middle of the action even though they're like, you know, it's totally fabricated propaganda. And there, in this instance, the propaganda is made by the soldiers. So you have soldiers making propaganda, sometimes even for other soldiers, in order to boost their moral. So the, the, the propaganda you find there is so diverse and speaks so many languages that somebody will, you know, will find it attractive just by the sheer diversity of propaganda that you find. Um, I, I just remind you of the uh, Russian warship uh, go home uh, stamp that you've probably heard about that you can you can buy. I mean this this is straight out of Reddit and um, and and really a new a, a really new level of propaganda. But again, it is not uh, the free interchange of information. It's all regulated. It is all curated. And, and it is not like, you know, like a soldier going on Reddit and uploading his video. That's, that's really how this works. It is going through um, either uh, government run or private run companies that then uh, curate this content uh, to, to, to feed it better to the target audience. What, what, everybody else who hasn't spoken yet, what are your thoughts? Are you thinking, oh, this crazy German uh, living in his in his bubble, seeing propaganda everywhere? Or what uh, what is going through your mind? I, I was thinking, um, I was really thinking on more the broader sense of since when did propaganda exist, right? Like it's now it's very, um, it's very, you can see the role that social media plays and all these technologies in, in bringing the masses to act in a certain way based on all these behavioral studies. But I wonder if it was, it always existed in a way and how did it look like? Um, so yeah, I don't know if, if, you've, if your research has gone that far. I can't hear you, you're mute. 
if I'd love to answer this question. Um, I also find this the history extremely interesting. And if you guys want, we can do an entire talk just about what happened before uh, the the, uh, the 1900s. It started off with clan elders and medicine men cutting parts in the skin of animal and hiding uh, stones or symbolic sim uh, symbols under the skin. And then to, for a special event, the animal is sacrificed. And what does the holy man find in this holy vessel of the holy goddess? <gasps> the symbol for war with our mortal enemies. Oh my God, the miracle. Um, uh, divine war has been announced. Um, that was where it started. And then it, um, it, 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 it got more and more professional, especially um, through the creation of the printing press in the Western world. I can't really speak to the history of propaganda in China, maybe a bit more today with the internet, but um, um, I don't know the, the historical evolution, but um, for, for like the Western world, I, 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 re I read up on it. And then when you have the printing press, you have an, like everybody wants to do propaganda. And the first thing the state does is like, we're just gonna kill everybody who does propaganda. And then nobody does propaganda again. And then it just, it goes on from there. This actually um, brings me back to a point where I was doing, I was writing my master thesis and I was doing some research into the whole concept of nations and nationalism and nation state system. And there was this very interesting book I can't remember the name of at the moment, but it, it spoke basically about this idea that if it wasn't for the print press, like if it wasn't for print, we would never have had this conceived collective identity of a nation, right? So it also makes me really question about this idea of messaging and um, uh, being able to send one message to a large group of people and how at one point, this could be perceived as propaganda, and at other point, it just really it makes up this collective identity that now is almost a second nature, right? Um, to all of us, in a way, I identify myself as an Egyptian, and it took me so long to ask, what does it really mean to be Egyptian, for example, or whatever country we come from? Yeah. I got nothing to add. You put it so beautifully. And, and for me, the, the construction of the national identity is one of the biggest groups of propaganda. Um, but is, uh, is that a European construct? The, the, the national, the nation state yes. and national, it's a European uh, construct uh, because before Europe went and started to exploit and the world, nothing like that really existed. One point on that, there's an important guy, people say that he's important here in Brazil, uh, called Chateaubriand, it's a French name. And he was the responsible to create this Brazil that you believe, and that I believe as well, most of the people in the world believe, you know, because before the antennas, he distributed TV antennas and radio antennas he distributed around the country to find a way to have a country of this size and called itself Brazil in 1940s. We were not Brazil. Uh, and we were kind of far away of this Brazil that you think like Samba, uh, whatever happens in the central area of Rio de Janeiro, that never related to the rest of the country, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, maybe, and I, I, I can remember those, those child of fictions movies, you know, where the, the big bad guy was the president that controlled all the meat around the road with his image and this kind of thing, you know? And you see this thing becoming a reality. You know, uh, and maybe in a few years we will be controlled by Putin. You know, his face all around the globe telling all the truth, and uh, or maybe Hillary or or maybe Bolsonaro. Who knows? You know, who's be the worldwide propaganda leader 
for my nephew. Uh, let me let me close if if uh, Mugetti, uh, Kristen, Lisa, if you don't want to contribute to the sausage fest. Um, no, okay. Um, I I gonna close by. Uh, by uh, asking you to reevaluate um, the importance of um, um, to to evaluate the importance of nationalism, and who, if if the concept of nationalism is con is is benefiting the citizen as much as the nation state, or if there are other forms of identity that have come about through the global awakening global civil society that are more appropriate for us as human beings to work together and to help one another, uh, except from like nationalism, paying taxes, voting once every four years, and, uh, and you know, dying for your country. Um, maybe these are fitting last words for, um, for this presentation. Yay. Thank you so much, George. Thank it you so was much. lovely to have you. I'm so glad that the talk happened and that we have this also as a reference, as a documentation for all those who weren't able to be here today. Thank you so much for taking the time. We'll continue with more events. So next Wednesday, we have also a very nice talk on bamboo. <laughs> Cases. Very interesting to go from propaganda to bamboo, but this is gig really, this is what I love about gig, right? It's somehow connected and related. So um, yeah, Paul, Maggetti, Vizawar, Kristen, Lisa, and of course, amazing Ricardo. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Have a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye. <laughs>